will let them in when they arrive. Um, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, welcome to this webinar uh, on Ecoside, uh, a new international crime uh, organised by the Brussels office of the uh, UK Law Societies. Uh, I'm Risa Giannini, I'm a policy advisor uh, in the Brussels office. Uh, the Brussels office has been in Brussels for a long time, over 25 years, um, and uh, we represent uh, the interest of uh, um, the solicitors, lawyers, uh, in the three uh, UK jurisdictions, England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. Today is, uh, if I may say just a few words, it's a sad day uh, when war is waged again on European soil. Um, and, uh, and today I think that we must reaffirm our commitment to deliver a peaceful, just and healthy world to future generations. And this webinar is uh, part of uh, this commitment, I believe. Some housekeeping rules, the webinar is recorded uh, and a link will be delivered to uh, all participants and feel free to circulate it. And uh, uh, it will also be the, uh, the link uh, on our website uh, if you want uh, to, um, to give it to, to other people. Uh, if you can please mute your uh, um, microphones so that to avoid uh, um, interference and you can post questions in the chat facility. Uh, I know that you are all very knowledgeable at this point of these uh, technologies, so you can uh, uh, put your question there or um, at the end when they will have a, a question and answer sessions if you want to put your hands up um, and uh, I will uh, let you uh, in. Um, the reason why we decided really to, to, to do this, uh, uh, this web webinar uh, is because we were inspired uh, by uh, the um, European Law Institute project on uh, ecocide. The European Law Institute, or ELI, as uh, is known around Europe, was founded in 2011 uh, with the ambition to study and stimulate European legal development in, uh, in a global uh, context. Uh, the first president of the, um, of the Institute, if I may boast a little bit, uh, was uh, uh, Diana Wallace, uh, who is uh, a, an English solicitor and also at the time an MEP and uh, vice president of the European Parliament. Uh, I recommend that you check uh, their website uh, just to see the breadth of their projects and and uh, and, uh, and what what they do and the, of the the topics that they covered, uh, which is uh, um, wide and extremely interesting. Uh, so, without further ado, I'll uh, uh, give uh, uh, um, the, the the floor to our speakers. Our first speaker is uh, uh, Robert Bray, uh, who many of you uh, will know uh, because he has held several positions within the European Parliament uh, from 1997 to 2017 when he retired. Uh, he was the head of unit of the Secretariat of the Legal Affairs Committee, the Jury Committee, um, and but he's also a lawyer. Um, and uh, uh, has particular interest in private international law, comparative law. So um, uh, uh, he was instrumental in setting up the um, Ellis Ecoside project, and he also chaired the high-level expert group meeting on corporate criminal, criminal liability, which obviously is very much linked uh, to our topic today. Um, and... Uh, um, uh, so he will be speaking about the project from LE and the international uh, aspects of uh, uh, this proposed ecocide crime. Robert, the floor is yours. Uh, 
Thank you very much, Rita, and thank you to the Law Society um, for inviting me and organising this webinar. Um, I would also like to join with Rita's words about the terrible events in R Ukraine. Um, the, uh, after all, the European Union is above all a peace project and it is a dreadful tragedy that this is taking place as we speak now. So, what is this all about? Well, as we, I'm sure you're all aware, we are living through what is basically a mass extinction event. When I, when I was young, used to watch the BBC, and you could see programmes about the Amazon jungle, which was unexplored. Everest was something that hardly anybody had been up. You know, in the 1950s, 1953, when they climbed Everest, now Everest is an open uh, lavatory for tourists queuing to go up it. In my native Devon, I used to be woken in the morning in the spring by the dawn chorus. Now there are hardly, there are hardly any birds. When you had a picnic, you were surrounded by wasps. Now you barely see a wasp. So we, we have a problem, a real problem. And also note that the terrible pollution of the watercourses in England, some of the most beautiful rivers in Europe are being polluted through the greed of the water companies. So, but this is not a new thing. The crime of ecocide has been under discussion for a long time. It was when they drew up the Rome Statute for the International Criminal Court, there was a proposal to include ecocide as a crime. It was blocked largely by the United Kingdom. There is, however, a crime in wartime of ecocide, and many proposals come through from a large number of academics and lawyers around the world. Um, I would mention in particular Professor Laurent Neré in France, who has done extensive work on, on a, a possible crime of ecocide, a proper possible international convention, and a possible criminal, uh, special criminal court for environmental crimes. But above all, I would mention Polly Higgins, the late Polly Higgins, who campaigned for ecocide to be recognised as a fifth crime against peace in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. She defined ecocide as the extensive damage to destruction of or loss of ecosystems of a given territory, whether by human agency or by other causes, to such an extent that peaceful enjoyment by the inhabitants of that territory has been or will be severely diminished. Polly Higgins' work has been taken up by the organisation she founded, which is called Stop Ecocide, um, which is um, organised by Jojo Meter, and they have been very active and they have got together a group of eminent lawyers under Professor Philip Sans QC, who have drawn up or drawn up on the 22nd of June last year an amendment to the Rome Statute to include a crime of ecocide. So this international independent drafting panel came up with this definition. Ecocide means unlawful or wanton acts committed with knowledge that there is a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. It goes on to define wanton as reckless disregard for damage, which would be clearly excessive in relation to the social and economic benefits anticipated. Severe means damage, which involves very serious adverse changes, disruption or harm to any element of the environment, including grave impacts on human life or natural, cultural or economic resources. And widespread means damage which extends beyond a limited geographic area, crosses state boundaries, or is suffered by an entire ecosystem 
or species or a large number of human beings. So what happens now? Well, this would have to be adopted by the state's party to the Rome statute, which is a long, long process if it ever gets through. It has support, has support from a number of countries, including Belgium and, um, and interest all around the world. Of course, there are some states such as Vanuatu who are more especially threatened by what is going on with global warming, uh, for instance, than the rest of us. Um, what, so what we decided to do in the European Union or in the European Law Institute was to try and encourage this process of the criminalization of ecocide by drawing up a model law which could be adopted by the European Union or other European members, other European states. Uh, in, in, we were thinking in particular of the possibility of drawing up a directive on the basis of Article 83 of the Treaty on the um, Functioning of the European Union on the model of the Directive for the Protection of the Environment through Criminal Law, uh, for which there is now a re revised proposal, very fortuitously for us. So we feel that if the European Union had such an instrument, Member States could act sorry, could act more quickly to prosecute and take action than is possible under the Rome statute. So we would also we also feel that the instrument that if the EU could act already to adopt a crime of ecocide, um, this this would encourage the process of adopting an international crime under the Rome statute. And at the same time, it would obviously be a powerful deterrent to companies and their offices based in the EU. Um, one of the things, of course, which is um, problematic is that the SANS definition is very, very general. It's very, it's quite, it uses words such as widespread, extensive, and this sort of thing, which would probably have a, would be problematic um, it's uh, in national law on the basis of the principle of legality that you have to be, I mean, you, crimes have to be defined in, in, a, in a definite and uh, clear way. So we are working on something much more detailed than SANS has come out with. We are lucky, in fact, that the Commission has come out with its revised proposal on, um, on uh, the uh, criminal liability directive because this actually contains now figures. The Commission has also moved in the direction of being much more precise in its definition of the existing crimes which exist at EU level and which member states should make sure they prosecute. We are not only considering criminal law, we are also considering civil remedies because we feel that you can act much faster in civil law than you can in criminal law. There is no possibility also of the government stepping in and stopping a prosecution as can occur in many member states. And you can act also for injunctive relief, which can so you can stop things before they start. You can also proceed in many member states in personam against directors and officers of companies. Because one of the problems that we have, in fact, about a criminal law instrument is that not all member states allow for um, corporate criminal liability, which is one of the reasons why the European Law Institute has set up its high level group to look into the question of corporate criminal liability. Um, one of the major member states, of course, which does not recognize corporate criminal liability is Germany. And uh, things are moving there slowly. But in the meantime, we have to assume, as the, as the Commission does, that some member states will not be able to produce, proceed against companies. But the Commission is saying that they have to provide for similar um, penalties in under administrative law, for instance. So some of the problems, there are many problems 
associated with this, which will involve us in um, detailed examination of um, what we are dealing with here. First of all, there is the question of the actress Reyes. As I said, the SANS proposal is rather vague and we intend to be more detailed. So we have to decide exactly what is a very, very serious environmental crime. Then there is the question of the mens rea, which is rather complicated. Um, Sands talks about knowledge. So you act in the knowledge that what you are going to do will be likely, or a reasonable per person might think it ha would have um, uh, an adverse, uh, uh, very bad effect on the environment. Because obviously, if you're drilling for oil, your intention is to drill for oil. It's a question of whether you're going to do it in such a way that it damages the environment. Um, this, uh, this, uh, another aspect which we are also looking at, which is something which was raised by Polly Higgins, was the idea that nature itself might have locus standi to bring proceedings. So animals, plants and all the rest of it should be able to be represented before the courts. And we think this is rather a good idea and that this could be handed over to the European Public Prosecutor's Office, which has just been set up. So we will also be drawing up model rules for that. We will also be looking at incohate offences such as uh, attempts and um, conspiracy and uh, this sort of thing. It's an, it's a great challenge. We hope to to get some uh, an initial draft published by 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 early summer. Um, we have a very good team. It includes Mark, who is uh, dealing with, in particular, the civil law aspects of this and uh, Fausto Pocar, who is the fellow re reporter with myself, who is a former judge at the International Tribunal for Rwanda and a leading light in many areas of law, in particular private international law. So I will leave it there for now, but I'm very happy to answer any questions and uh, join in the general discussion. Thank you. Rita, you're mute. I'm sorry, <laughs> as usual. <laughs> uh, I was saying thank you, Robert, and um, that was uh, uh, fascinating and quite technical. And I'm looking forward, uh, possibly, to be to be at least a, a listener, uh, uh, if not a direct part of uh, of this group um, uh, in uh, the European Law Institute. Um, our second speaker, uh, and we are very, uh, very happy to have her with us, is uh, uh, Sirpa Pietikainen, uh, MEP, and she is a Finnish uh, uh, member of the uh, uh, European Parliament or from the European People's Party, uh, but she is also a former Finnish Minister of Environment. Um, and uh, uh, she has two particular interests which are fundamental in this topic, which is uh, uh, the environment and the economy. So uh, that is uh, a, a, a very good combination uh, to, to balance uh, uh, this topic. Uh, Sirpa is a, a graduate from the Helsinki School of Economics uh, and uh, um, she's active in uh, several organizations. She's uh, uh, in the trust, uh, uh, she's a chairmanship of Globe EU and also she is a member of the Ecoside Parliamentary Alliance. This is an organization which I didn't know about. Um, a group which I didn't know about before I started looking into Ecoside and it looks uh, an extremely powerful um, group uh, of people with uh, great influence all over the world um, and, uh, and uh, it, it reminds me a bit of something which I remember was active years ago which was uh, the um, uh, um, the Environment Parliament, 
Environmental Parliament, which is again was again a group of MEPs who were active uh, um, MPs and MEPs all over the world who were active uh, in this uh, in this field. So, Sipa, to you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. And uh, firstly, I'm very delighted to be part of this uh, uh, roundtable and discussion that I hope is going to gather even more and more people uh, together. Because firstly, I think that we need to gather together a strong alliance, firstly, of politicians who do have the political will to put their side in national legislation, in EU legislation, and on international conventions in the longer runs. And there, actually, this alliance of ecocide is a good example from the European Parliament. My two sons and myself have been, been the founding uh, members of this uh, group that has gathered quite a lot of uh, support and interest. And European Parliament has six times altogether uh, added the echo side on its resolutions or on its uh, points of view of EU legislation. We have not yet managed to put it on the articles of EU legislation, but then again, uh, as a part of resolutions, it actually signs the political will. And I remember when I proposed first time the ecocide about um, less than 10 years ago, everybody was looking to me like I would have lost my mind. That how do you and how can you propose something like this? How you define it and how you put it in practice and who is the offender and who is the criminal and who is the victim and no, 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 no. And uh, the the uh, nature, of course, and the state of the nature can't be a subject in, in criminal nor the civil law cases. And no, yes, we are already there. And I'm so delighted that this uh, movement of uh, ecocide that did not actually start, as we heard from the European Parliament, but gains a strong support is getting a stronger and stronger in uh, international support. So politicians who have the will and guts to push it forward. And you, lawyers, judges, experts who know how to do it. You know, uh, having a good lawyer is like knowing where's the handle in the door. It makes the access very much more easy because as you know you can break the door from the other side also and get in but it's so much hard so the combination of a good lawyers and politicians the feel uh, the the uh, the will and the talent makes the excellent content what we can push forward and the third wheel here is the civil society None of us can uh, make anything to happen if we do not have the support of uh, civil society and broader understanding and discussion, for example, in public media. And this is something what we need to be working uh, up all together. And this is what we've been uh, trying to do in our uh, behalf from the European Parliament by organizing the discussions by trying to collect the media, by sending press releases, by contacting our colleagues, by contacting the different NGOs to try to get this sort of a enlarging circle of uh, civil society to support, understand and push this forward. Okay, what do you, we think at the moment we need? We need better definitions. We need uh, a credible growing uh, bunch of lawyers to support this in national, EU and global level. And of course, you are the core. But I was wondering, for example, the ecocide group that exists in Finland. Uh, there's a large majority of good and excellent lawyers and environmental lawyers and human rights lawyers that are not yet part of that movement. How do we get all those enlightened, skillful lawyers 
and judges on member state level to be aware of this uh, discussion, to support it and join the movement. And this is something what we as a politicians, of course, try to, uh, to uh, do on our, on our behalf and, and convince. But I think that it would merit a lot of such prestige people like yourselves could be having a stronger outreach to your legal community to uh, to uh, publicize and make aware and uh, uh, start gathering people stronger and stronger as a part of this union. Okay, and let's then go a bit of the political, not too radical, but political thinking on this second side. It actually has five points. And the first is the pristine and the existential value of the nature itself. So the destruction, the permanent destruction, like uh, biodiversity loss or grave, uh, um, uh, grave uh, uh, mining accidents, uh, mine mining sites, or climate change that matter, are a crime against nature itself doing something that it can't recuperate. And I would go even a bit further what Robert has uh, said uh, a minute ago, so that the nature has this kind of a, a state, uh, good environmental status, good ecosystem status that is the right. And then when we uh, unbalance it, actually it is minor or uh, uh, a bigger liability for us. And of course, then it is a bit higher threshold before we call uh, call it an echo site. And this is something that I'm trying to push now when uh, uh, I'm uh, uh, the rapporteur in the European Parliament of EU criminal uh, environmental uh, law. Uh, that is the Parliament's own initiative report on, uh, on this side. But it has a, a, another politically very important element. So it is the inherent right of the nature itself and I think, I think it is excellent proposal that uh, it should be the EU prosecutor to, to take charge in EU level about uh, speaking in behalf of this nature's rights. But then it is the human right. And it doesn't say anywhere that you need to kill uh, people with machete to uh, commit yourself uh, to, to, to be acting a crime against humanity. If you know that the pollution and the climate change is going to kill people in tens and tens of thousands per year in excessive matters and numbers, it should be called a crime against humanity. So there can't be a mass murder without touching a, an inch with a finger to someone else. If you, with a consistent neglect, uh, uh, avoid your political responsibility, the due diligence, the liability to act to save the human lives of uh, on, on your uh, 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 people, on your nation, on your area in the EU. And how to put that in uh, in EU's constitution in longer, longer run and in national legislation or even better on interpretation of the existing law. And why I'm so excited about the courtroom activism is that nowadays it's very difficult to put new ambitious legislation, environmental legislation on places, you know. But what about if we can uh, interpret the existing risk concepts, the liability concepts, the human health concepts and the rights concept, uh, concepts differently and by that way actually expands the, uh, uh, the, the, the nature's rights and human rights where livable environment is quite concretely, I think, uh, one. And this is sort of these two elements we are trying to put and achieve it by our wordings. And then in the longer run, of course, it should be international, uh, international conventions, but already now, knowing that the success is probably not that high. We, I think that uh, some group of lawyers and NGOs should try this crime against humanity case uh, uh, 
and then sue some of the governments about their actions uh, actions on 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 environmental basis a bit radical idea but i'm i'm looking forward on your uh, uh reactions and last but not least then it is the next step is to make that kind of a legal analysis a continuum of uh, what this ecocide means in different fields of the nature resources access to resources climate change biodiversity chemicalization that is out of the hand we know the growing risks and uh, uh, gmo another a bit of the unknown factors and how could we take a principle that is rather sound in international conventions already and that is the precautionary principle for real as as this kind of a stepping stone of interpretation how you should act because of course uh, the tobacco companies say we didn't know and all of us are saying we didn't know but uh, if you are a member of the board you uh, in in private company uh, and I'd be sitting in in those places you are liable to know your excuse can't be i don't know i'm not up to to the challenge of my work and then again uh if you add there the uh, precautionary principle if there's a reasonable doubt that something is risky and stupid and irreversible don't do it try to make other ways to to make it uh, economic profit or expand your markets or produce your energy or whatever and that could help quite a lot of in our interpretations so you sort of a, would reverse the burden of proof now it's always the problem as long as you can't uh, have the burden of proof that these chemical chemicals like uh, or chemical cocktails kill people probably just go on doing it and then if it is a new set of the chemicals even those the reach or whatever you have to have the proof that uh, uh, something really serious happens but with this precautionary principle what about if it would be a reasonable doubt that this adequate to raise the limit and if you can't prove that this is a super safe don't do it because you have still uh, you still have existing chemicals materials different uh, other ways to produce energy than the risky ones well uh sorry for taking so much of your time but just wanted to give you a bit of the flavor of what we politicians from cross party and cross uh, member states in the european parliament are working at and thinking on this topic and looking forward for very fruitful and long uh, long term uh, cooperation with you Thank you, Sirpa. That that was that was great, and it's so good to hear a politician saying things like that. <laughs> Don't do it if it's not safe. Um, and and also it was quite ironic you know, to hear you know, this alliance between politicians and lawyers who are notoriously the most distrusted people. So no, it's it's up to us to to make sure that uh, the people realize that uh, we can uh, work for good as well, <laughs> both of us. Um, our third speaker is uh, uh, Mark Plough. Mark is uh, um, a, a lawyer, <laughs> one of. Uh, one of the lawyer uh, and uh, is an expert on EU law, uh, including competition, state aid, and uh, public procurement. And uh, he has, in the past, worked for the European Parliament as well in the European Parliament, not for the European Parliament. He was uh, um, appointed Queen's Council uh, in 1999. She's he's also a Scottish solicitor um, and uh, a mediator. Um, Mark is a member of the team working on the Eli project on Ecoside and uh, um, as Robert says, said, he's looking uh, particularly at the civil consequences and, uh, of, uh, of this crime, which I believe is very, a very important matter because it, it, it might actually make easier 
to, to <laughs> remedies. Mark, to you. Uh, thank you very much, Rita. I'm not sure I'm going to live up to that description, but I'm uh, very uh, honoured to be part of this webinar uh, with my distinguished colleagues, who I'm afraid know a lot more about the subject than I do. Uh, I'm indeed part of the uh, LE working group with Robert, uh, largely to learn about Echoside, but also perhaps to contribute uh, a few thoughts on the civil side. We have lost Mark. You lo lost me? Yeah, you're back now. Yeah, sorry, I, we lost I, I, you for a moment. Okay, I would. Uh, I was just going to say I'm going to make a few uh, points on the civil side uh, relevant to Echo side. Can you still hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, if everybody can make sure their their um, microphone is switched off because we had some interference or interference. <laughs> sorry, my English. Uh, so thank you, uh, Rita. Before I start, I want to offer my support to the people of Ukraine, where at one time of my life, uh, I was a frequent visitor, supporting its ambitions to join the EU and indeed its uh, legal interests in that context. It is certainly a sad day today for Ukraine. But for Echo side, the role of the civil courts is going to be important and more reliable, in my view, than the implementation of policy and legislation by governments and politicians. Pace, the European Parliament. Uh, it, it will have a major impact on compliance by government, as well as business and individuals. And the importance of the courts has already been demonstrated in cases from many countries, uh, including the 10 following uh, that may be well known to you all. The Netherlands, France, the UK, Germany, Belgium, and the new, in the wider world, New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, the US, of course, and even the European Court of Justice, although the European Court so far has managed to rule an uh, uh, interesting Swedish case inadmissible on the grounds that the application for judicial review, uh, the, the conditions for bringing an application were not met by the uh, applicants. I'm going to come back to those cases in a moment, but just to emphasize that these uh, ca cases are, uh, are highly re relevant to the, uh, uh, to the implementation of fundamental and human rights, and several of them rely on Article 2 uh, the right to life and Article 8, the right to respect for private and family life in the European Convention on Human Rights. It may be fair to say that this started with the Dutch Jurgenda case, which was first decided in 2015. Turning now just to look at some of those cases briefly, uh, we, we have um, an interesting case in the UK, funnily enough, uh, uh, the the um, uh, Crown against the Secretary of State for Transport, uh, which um, actually upheld an application for judicial review against the uh, Minister, the, the, the Secretary of State for Transport, for failing to take into account the government's own policy on climate change following the Paris Agreement. Uh, in the context of, of, re of why relief should be granted, the court said it was a basic defect in the decision-making process that the Secretary of State expressly decided not to take into account the Paris Agreement at all. And the court qualified that omission as a fundamentally wrong turn in the whole process. And the court then said that a remedy would be granted on the grounds of exceptional public interest, given the extreme importance of the legal issues and the fact that the issue of climate change is a matter of profound national and international importance of great concern to the public and indeed to the government of the United Kingdom and many other national governments, as is demonstrated by their commitment to the Paris Agreement. The court actually went into 
uh, went to great lengths to explain the scope and consequences of its decision and said the government will now have the opportunity to uh, reconsider its, its uh, decision-making process in accordance with the clear statutory requirements that Parliament has imposed, among which is that to take into account its own firm policy commitments on climate change under the Paris Agreement. So that, that case uh, I would flag up for you as being of major importance. And it, it is, of course, not on its own. Uh, there's a similar uh, decision taken uh, by the German Supreme Court and indeed the French Conseil d'État requiring their governments to comply with the, uh, effectively, with the Paris Agreement uh, uh, emissions um, uh, re reduction targets. I won't go into great details in, in, on those because there uh, we don't have uh, very much time. I just want to highlight again that, that in the Netherlands, uh, <coughs> excuse me, that the, the two cases uh, of very great importance. The most recent one, which you'll all have heard about concerning Royal Dutch Shell, uh, on the 26th of May, 2021, the Hague District Court ordered Shell to cut its carbon emissions by 45% in comparison to its 20, 2019 levels. This is the first time that a court has ordered a company to comply with CO2 emission reduction targets under the Paris Agreement. Uh, the claim was filed by seven N NGOs who argued that Shell had breached Article 2, Right to Life, and Article 8, Rights to Private and Family Life and Home of the European Convention on hum of Human Rights. And this indeed followed the earlier decision of the, of the Supreme Court of the Netherlands, which, I, which upheld in, in December 2019 the earlier ruling in the agenda, agenda case against the Netherlands government. Uh, and, and uh, excuse me, which, which held that Article 2 and Article 8 of the ECHR offer protection against the consequences of dangerous climate change due to CO2 emissions adduced from global warming. I just want to briefly mention the uh, Australian case about a coal mine uh, planning application where, where the Australian court uh, didn't actually grant an order against the coal mine, but it didn't grant one in favor of it, but it made legal history in a sense in that it established uh, that in Australian law, uh, the governments and decision make, political decision makers owe a duty of care to the public. And in this context, the public with the future children of Australia. And in that, 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 uh, uh, for that reason, the Australian uh, case is, is um, considered a landmark uh, decision. It, it was um, uh, the Australian, uh, the court case was brought by eight children and the Australian Federal Court found that the government has a duty of care to protect young people from climate change. Uh, the court considered whether the minister had a duty of care to avoid causing children harm resulting from the additional extraction of coal from the particular mine expansion. And it found, a quote, a reasonable person in the position of the minister would foresee that by reason of the extension project's effect on increased CO2 in the Earth's atmosphere and the consequential increase in global surface temperatures, each of the children is exposed to a risk of death or personal injury. And the court held that in order to respond to changing social conditions resulting from the increased ability of humans to do harm to others through atmospheric pollution, quote, the common law should now impose correlative responsibility on those who hold, quote, previously unimaginable power to harm tomorrow's adult. I won't go into any more details on that. Uh, I won't say anything about the very interesting cases in Belgium, uh, where again, the, the court of first instance in Brussels has condemned uh, the Belgian government's failure to uh, comply fully with, the, with, it, with its own interpretation of the uh, Paris Agreement. Finally, let me just uh, mention a few statistics to show you that civil litigation is not going away. 
but is rapidly increasing. The number of, number of cases has doubled over the last five years, according to a 2021 study by the London School of Economics. In 2017, uh, 884 cases had, had been brought before in 24 countries. By July 2020, that number had doubled to 1,550 in 58 countries, as well, of course, in the European Court of Justice. I think I've used my 10 minutes, Rita. I better shut up. Thank you. <laughs> You're on mute, Rita. Oh, this is terrible habit. I shouldn't mute myself at all. Uh, what I was saying is, is, thank you, Mark. And if anybody would like uh, to ask uh, a question uh, uh, to our speakers, uh, they you can either write it in the chat or you can put your hand up uh, and uh, um, I'll give you the floor. Um, I'm, I'm using my usual uh, uh, chair's privilege <laughs> to ask a question myself, um, and uh, it, which is uh, related uh, again to what Mark was uh, uh, was uh, talking about. Um, it, it, I, it's not very clear to me. I mean, I am not uh, um, a, a, a very good lawyer. Let's face it; <laughs> I haven't been a lawyer for a long time. Um, but you know, what the, uh, could a, a, an ecocide crime? Uh, the, how could the, having ecocide as a crime, say at European level, if not yet at international level, uh, how could this help in uh, uh, actually uh, um, civil actions uh, and how could this help redress cases because we know the criminal cases are slow are complicated um, they you know, they the 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 threshold for proof is very is very high but could at the same time if there is a case, a criminal case, you know, could this help a civil case, which could actually you know, uh, uh, then have a result, uh, 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 a quicker and and uh, and helpful result? This is a question to the lawyers, as <laughs> Robert and and Mark. What do well, you think? Well, if. If I, if I start first, um, I'm not sure Mark is better qualified than me, but um, yes, but obvi obviously um, the existence of, of, of a crime at European level would be, a, would be a major deterrent anyway. And once you have a crime, then if you bring criminal proceedings, you can always join on the continent as a partie civile. And where you have a crime, you're also, that will be also a civil wrong and it will be possible to sue. And what we are proposing to do is examine the rules of the Rome II regulation on the law applicable to torts and delicts to see whether they need improving. We think they do. Um, and also look at uh, the Brussels 1 beast regulation about um, jurisdiction, where you can sue and, and, and so on. So that, that, would, that would be that, that would be certainly advantageous. Um, one of the things that we looked at, because I was also involved in the project of Diana Wallace on supply chain liability, is the question of simplifying the whole business of suing uh, internationally um, on the basis of, of tort obligations, a duty of care in the English common law sense. Because when you look at these cases involving private international law, it's a big game in lots of ways. I love private international law. It's the next best thing to theology, but slightly less, slightly more complicated. Um, um, but it is it is a game for these big corporations to play out between themselves before they decide exactly when they're going to settle. And if you get involved in these as a, a private a group of private individuals, say, um, 
people working in a factory in the third world or indigenous people in, in Africa or South America who've suffered uh, the results of the depredations of European and American companies. They find themselves playing a very, very difficult game with against very, very expensive lawyers. I, if, I don't know if you read the article in The Guardian the other day by Elena Brokovich about um, the Chevron case and um, the, the lawyer of the indigenous people there, Mr. Donzinger, who has ended up under house arrest and uh, has been persecuted by, by Chevron, who just playing a filthy game. As they said, the, the lawyer for Chevron said, we will fight these people till hell freezes over. And when it does, we'll fight them on the ice. You know, this is we, we have to make civil proceedings easier for people in these these circumstances. And one of the ways, of course, will be if we can give the European Public Prosecutor's Office um, the, the, the ability to take up cases on behalf of nature and on behalf of indigenous people that haven't got the resources to fight. I don't know, Mark wants to add anything properly. Just uh, very, very briefly uh, to point out the obvious and why you mentioned Rome too in the Brussels regulation. Uh, in some jurisdictions, a, a criminal conviction can be used as evidence in a civil claim. But I don't know whether it's in all jurisdictions. It is in, in uh, English and Welsh law, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and probably Scottish. But um, I, I would imagine that it is in the civil law countries sim, sim, a similar uh, feature, because it would be strange to have a civil judgment contradicting a criminal decision that's already been taken by a court. So in that context, you're, I think perhaps Rita's question is heading in that direction, and that I think is um, is highly possible. Thank you. Yeah. We have uh, a question from Julio Leal. Um, I'm going to read it. It's quite long. Why the so-called global governance paradigm itself as a paradigm of expertise and interdisciplinary approach, not necessarily legal, in opposition to a more traditional approach to international law, such as the wrong statute amendment, is incapable of solving the problem. And I think that the core of the question is at the end, will ecocide really work without China, India or the US? I think this might be a question for Sirpa. Will ecocide really work without China, India or the US? The somber was, uh, answer could be no. But if we think of all the political developments, what we have made throughout the history, you never have that kind of a moment where all the people in the world are going to jump at the same minute on the air. And that means that someone needs to lead, someone needs to create the agenda. And this has been very important role uh, for the EU. We set after the financial crisis quite an ambitious level of liability for auditors. We set, uh, set that on, uh, <clears throat> on credit rating agencies. We have been pushing the circular economy concept globally, the ETS concept on climate change, and uh, now uh, <coughs> both in USA and in China. <coughs> There's the ETS systems a plus willingness to, <coughs> to move towards a international convention. Takes time. And we have the latest is the taxonomy and the discussion about sustainable finance, how to integrate in financial regulation the liability and the costs and the, uh, the, the sustainability indicators. So we can start it we can push it. Probably it will take a long time. Probably it's going to be hard, but you never get it if you try it. If you decide that by sitting here, I never can get up, that probably is true if you don't even try. But then again, 
there are that kind of a, a sensible moments in the history we all know that suddenly we pass through systems like the UN after the Second World War. We have had uh, uh, rather ambitious and fine uh, 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 disarmament process, not at the moment, but in the history. And then some our moments about the environmental legislation. So I'm convinced that we need to do it. And just because it's the right and uh, thing to do. And I think that without these kind of a totally new tools and totally new severe uh, way of attacking these things, uh, uh, handling these things, sorry, uh, we we actually cannot uh, achieve the sustainability. Plus then again, and there's the glimmer of hope, and I might be, I, I admit, uh, over overly positive, but there are a lot of this kind of a courtroom activism and willingness uh, in in uh, in the uh, 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 local and regional uh, uh, sides on on USA as well. So there might be that kind of a political will to get the ball rolling in one of these days. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a, in, in another question. Uh, we don't have much time, but I think we can squeeze this one here. It's an interesting one. How cows, and it's from Yulia, how cows, causation in the crime of ecocide can be established? Can the result, the environmental damage, be always assigned to specific actions? Sirpa. If I may, very, very briefly, then I, I guess our experts uh, should continue. This is what we are debating also in the taxonomy and sustainable finance, you know, when there's the materiality. Uh, the materiality is understood usually what is the direct consequence for the company and uh, 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 be it economic or be it uh, environmental risk, your cellar is going to be flooded or whatever, and technology, uh, economic risks. And then now we are talking about there this sort of a, a, a double materiality or responsibility for the society. Uh, it's a bit like the nature's rights. But what is more interesting is the triple materiality. So it basically uh, says that you are either part of the problem or part of the solution. We know that within 10 to 20 years, the planet is uh, unlivable if we continue using the fossils. So if you finance fossils, if you use fossils, if you are part of the fossil economy, you are part of the problem that is going to destroy your own economy. So it is a financial and direct risk, materiality risk for the company. Or then you are part of the solution. You try to, to transit out of the, these, <coughs> these sources and to, with a transition plan to, to be within 10 to 15 years uh, climate neutral. And I guess we could use the same here also in environment, if biodiversity is as such a threat it is, so if you destroy an inch of the biodiversity somewhere, you can't say that this park actually was the, <coughs> the uh, tipping point, but you can say that you either destroy it or then you leave it without destroyment, and even better, you overcompensate uh, com uh, it. That is this rewildering concept. And by that way, uh, the, the, the time of catastrophe is actually so close that that comes material for companies and actions. Your actions as a part of it uh, will have dire uh, uh, consequences within 10 years, 15 years maximum. Um, Robert, Mark? Now you're muted. Yeah, now the problem of causation, which is also tied up with the question of mens rea, all the, the ingredients that you had to prove um, to get somebody um, 
prosecuted is a, is a tricky one. Of course, um, Polly Higgins suggested that the crime should be one of strict liability, of objective liability. That means that you know you are responsible. You don't have to prove that you intended or were negligent or whatever. If it happens as a direct result of what what you've been up to, then you're liable. The problem is many of our legal systems, uh, in, when it comes to the criminal law, have problems with strict liability. There are areas where there, where there is strict liability, but not generally in the area of strict criminal law. Um, what the approach taken by the Sands Group is to say it's based on knowledge, so that if you knew when you started out, or perhaps you could say if a person skilled in the art of oil drilling or whatever it is would have reasonably anticipated that the result of his actions would have been severe pollution, then you would be liable. Um, so it's 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 something that we're going to have to look at very very carefully to find some good some good wording. Um, so avoiding strict liability because of um, general um, jurisprudential ideas about um, what criminal law should be about, and um, uh, not allowing people to get away with it. But I think that it, that's probably the answer. That if you are because. Nobody is, is, or very few people are in a situation where they're deliberately set out to cause damage to the environment. What happens is that they are reckless or they don't care. Yes, they know they want to get the oil out of the ground, or they know that they want to chop down the, the trees in the, in the rainforest, and they don't care what the consequence, the other consequences are. So it's, it's a question of looking at that and finding a good form of wording that will cover um, the, this idea of causation and and the mental element required to prove the crime, but uh, it it is a very good question. Yeah, the, 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 there is another question which is relating actually to the presumption of innocence, of innocence. They say, how can you um, uh, reconcile, reconcile with the presumption of innocence, taking into account that one particular behaviour could affect or reveal its effects on the environment in a very long period of time. So it would be more difficult to identify the, 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 who, who did it. I'm not sure about that, though, mm -hmm. in the sense that these days, uh, it seems to me that it is quite obvious. Uh, um, yeah, it's like the tobacco company saying, well, no, but you will be dying in 40 years. So who was responsible? Well, was the tobacco producers. Uh, yes, the, 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 other, the other problem, of course, is the question of uh, licenses and authorizations, because often, um, you know, you just don't go and drill for oil in the middle of Amazonia. You get a permit, you know from the local government who are in cahoots with you anyway, probably. So, you know, then then when something bad happens and you take proceedings, they say, oh, well, we were, were authorised, we had a licence, we did it all in conformity with the licence. So that's another area that has to be looked at. But you also have to cover people. You know, if you do have a permit, you, you do have a permission to do something. And it's so, you know, but in the end, this sort of problem is for the courts to sort, to sort out. And having this crime in Europe, going back to what we were talking about before, it's important because you, you could, people like to come to Europe. You remember when General Pinochet came to Europe and had a rather nasty surprise. Well, the same could happen to the, um, the CEO of a big oil company or um, um, an, a, manufacturer, a, a, a timber company or whatever comes to Europe and finds that they are arrested um, when they land on the tarmac at Heathrow or at Charles de Gaulle and find themselves uh, in court. You know? So it's, it's, it's uh, you know, the, the, the Americans and the Chinese and the Indians cannot say, well, we're not signing up, we're not signed up to the Rome Statute, we're not taking any notice of this. It does affect them because they like to have their freedoms as well, these very rich people that own the companies. Right, thank you very much. I think that we have already <laughs> gone over, so we don't want to impose further on your 
on your time. Thank you very much. I think it was uh, uh, very interesting and, uh, and very uh, stimulating. And I think we, we will come back to this because I think it's, uh, it's, a, it's something that uh, is going to be important for everybody. Thank you very much and have a good afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Lisa. you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you, bud. Bye. Bye.